Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is San Wu. I'm an assistant professor at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And I'm very happy to have you all of, uh, with us today and a warm welcome to all of you. So earlier this year, World Hepatitis Alliance and the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine team jointly organized a global crowdsourcing open call for advocacy and individual stories fighting against viral hepatitis. And today we will discuss how hepatitis has impacted people and communities in Africa. And so for this webinar, we provide uh, simultaneous uh, translation and have both English and French channels. And you can find some instructions here. Um, and now please allow me to introduce a few speakers and Juma Ada, uh, Joseph Tucker, Claire Amon, and Annie Kapokri. Dan Shuma is currently a fellow in the New Voices program for the Aspen Institute and the president-elect of the World Hepatitis Alliance. And he has been a vocal advocate for people living with viral hepatitis in Nigeria and in Africa. And Dr. Joseph Tucker is a associate professor at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and a real pioneer in crowdsourcing research, and he will give us a brief introduction to crowdsourcing. Claire is a, a recent graduate of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, uh, and Dr. Annie Kapokri is a research fellow at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and they will both give us a presentation to provide more details about the global open call and hepatitis related key issues we identified uh, in the open call relevant to Africa. Now over to you, Tanjuma. And on behalf of the World Hepatitis Alliance, I would say welcome. And I'm excited to be part of the speakers and part of the great, wonderful panel. I'm part of this official pre-meeting um, to call them. The World Hepatitis Alliance is a membership-based group of over 300 members, and we are over in over 100 countries. Just like this webinar says, behind the numbers, behind the statistics of 1.3 million deaths and the over 60 million people are people living with chronic hepatitis. And these are our members. These are people living with hepatitis. And they are the face behind all the numbers and the statistics we have about morbidity or mortality about hepatitis. I would like to say on behalf of the World Hepatitis Alliance that you sit back and enjoy this webinar and also the remaining part of the colder meeting. I would like to say thank you to the organizers of the Conference on Liver Disease in Africa. Thank you to all the panel members and thank you to London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and everybody around this webinar. And thank you participants for joining. I hope that you enjoy this meeting and you learn and also network. So thank you and do have a nice day. Thanks, Tajuma. Now over to you, Joe. Thanks, Don. Um, I'd like to echo Danjuma's sort of warm welcome and, um, and sort of reflect a little bit on how we got to where we are today. There's so many people who are profoundly affected by hepatitis B and hepatitis C. And beyond the numbers, there really are amazing stories and voices. And we, we really have to have a structured way to hear these voices and to lift them up. And so what our group has used is, is crowdsourcing approaches. Crowdsourcing has a group of individuals solve part of a problem and then shares back some solutions and ideas with the public. And that's the basic idea that motivated this open call for stories on hepatitis. We were particularly interested in stories from Africa. And that's why we were thrilled to have this opportunity to have a pre-meeting with Colda. And we see this um, sort of more community-based meeting as, as one important way to amplify community voices. So I'd like to thank um, the WHA, the, the Colda team, um, also, NHEP 2030, the Hepatitis Fund, for their support of, of this open call. Um, we're really grateful to be a part of the team, and I'm thrilled to see our finalists today and to hear from them and to hear from such a distinguished group of individuals. So back over to you, Don. Thanks, Joe. Uh, now I would like to pass the floor to Annie and Claire.
Hi everyone, my name is Anaïk Mokri and on behalf of our organizing team, I'll be presenting to you today the process and findings from our crowdsourcing open call to expand public engagement and advocacy in chronic viral hepatitis. So to provide a brief background, crowdsourcing has been widely defined as having a large group solve a problem and then sharing the solutions widely with the public. Challenge contests are one very common tool for implementing crowdsourcing methods. So you may want to ask why is it being used often? Crowdsourcing incorporates public engagement, so it opens up a channel for communicating with the public with your project. It allows for socially and culturally inclusive solutions, and then it opens an opportunity for innovative solutions. Crowdsourcing open calls are implemented in six main steps. So first of all, you want to select crowdsourcing as your method. Secondly, you organize or convene a community-engaged steering group who will oversee the project and then finalize the details of the call. The next step is you want to engage the com community to contribute using different promotional strategies, after which you receive and evaluate the submissions. Next, you recognize the exceptional entries as finalists, and then finally you share or implement the solutions. So moving on to the specific details of our open call, the main purpose was to solicit stories relating to lived experiences with viral hepatitis. So what were we looking for? We're particularly interested in personal or family stories about living with hepatitis or advocacy experiences. We requested images, videos, audio files, infographics, or even written narratives. And the main focus of this call was specifically to engage with participants within the African and Asian regions. And in terms of distribution, we collaborated with local community-based organizations, and we also used the World Hepatitis Alliance Global Connections to distribute the call widely. At the end of the promotion, we had a total of 119 submissions. After initial screening, 85 were eligible for judging. We sent off to our volunteer judges and we had 29 submissions qualify as finalists. Here we define a finalist submission as entries with a mean score of 7 and above. Now, looking at the submission characteristics, in terms of the participants, we had more males than female participants, so 44%. And then we had almost half of our participants had a lived experience with viral hepatitis, and 62% had either family or friend with lived experience with viral hepatitis. And looking at the entries we received, they were in different languages. We had more in English language, 64%. Other languages include Chinese, French, Arabic, and Spanish. And in terms of the formats, we had more text narratives. There were some infographics and images and a few audio and video files. Now, looking at the engagement from the African region, we had a total of 16 submissions from the African continent. Up north, we had Egypt, Sudan. Looking at West Central parts, we had Africa, um, Nigeria, Cameroon, Congo, DRC, and towards the Eastern African region, we had participation from Uganda, Burundi, and Tanzania. We had four finalists from Africa. These were from DRC, Congo, Benin, and Burundi. And we had some community-based organizations involved with the finalist submissions from Sudan, Uganda, DRC, and Burundi. So next we would hear from one of our finalist entries, which happens to be a child activist for, for viral hepatitis. Bonjour. Bon, je m'appelle Bonlis. Hello, my name is Brandy. I'm a member of Asoyedek uh, Children. I advocate for children suffering from hepatitis B. As you know, hepatitis kills in RDC, but people don't know it. Um, the treatment is very expensive. There's no vaccination at birth, and the only um, there are few NGOs that raise 
awareness and they are the only ones so i'm sad to see um, a friend of mine who's been infected through transfusion um, we uh, children we say stop we say no to hepatitis uh, due to transmission and transfusion our friend can simply cannot simply wait for the treatment we need to act now we need to immunize babies at birth so we ask the head of state to get involved in the fight against the disease we ask him to donate money to our association for the um, awareness um, to raise awareness um, we want the head of state to provide the drugs the treatment um, in the fight against this disease. My name is Brelise. I'm nine years old and I thank you. Bonjour. So that was um, one of our finalist entry from the African region that pretty much covers a lot of some of the key teams. So following analysis, we identified these key issues, mother-to-child transmission, high costs of treatment and care for hepatitis, a lot of stigma and discrimination within the society and also amongst healthcare providers. There's still a lot of misinformation around the spread and transmission of hepatitis, government negligence. The role of advocacy in hepatitis services is very key and then the need for supportive policies for hepatitis care. There's also high hepatitis HIV co-infection rate within this region and unsafe injections within clinical settings still contributing to transmission of the disease. Now I'll talk a bit more detail for some of the key teams. So first, the mother to child transmission. Now a lot of bodies advocating for hepatitis have identified the fact that preventing mother to child transmission is a very important strategy to control the spread of the disease. Now, I've taken this um, post from one of the tweets from the WHO Africa region, canvassing for a hepatitis-free future for Africa, where one of the key messages is also targeting the stopping transmission from mother to child, con canvassing and advocating for all pregnant women to be routinely tested for hepatitis and provided treatment if needed and then also the high cost of treatment and care a lot of african countries do not have really established healthcare insurance systems so majority of the population still pay out of pocket for health care and knowing fully well that the cost for hepatitis treatment is very high it becomes unaffordable for the majority of the population also, stigma and discrimination is still a lot within the society and also amongst or from healthcare providers. A lot of people still feel embarrassed having or living with the disease. So there's a lot of enlightenment, awareness and education that still needs to go on around hepatitis, how it is spread and how it is transmitted. So based on all of this, the next steps and implications would be for advocacy groups, particularly in Africa, to target some of these key points, including prevention of mother to try transmission, the cost of care, addressing stigma and discrimination by creating more awareness campaigns, and then getting the government and political bodies more involved. There's also the need for further empowerment for some of these identified CBOs and also the finalists in this open call to kind of strengthen the advocacy through extended working groups. And then we'll also need to disseminate the finalist messages to help advocacy and to support hepatitis awareness within this region. And overall, we're just creating an environment for sharing hepatitis story and connecting more hepatitis activists. We'd like to say a big thank you to our collaborators, the steering group, the volunteer judges, all our participants, and also the Hepatitis Fund for sponsoring this project. Thank you.
Thanks, Annie. These are really excellent work, and uh, thanks for the uh, wonderful presentation. Um, this is a really important work, and these submissions have informed uh, key things that we're going to have a discussion around. Uh, now, let's move to our panel discussion, and I would like to introduce our chairperson, Jessica Higgs. So she is the head of programs at the World Hepatitis Alliance. She's a very experienced project manager with over 10 years of experiences working within the charity health sector, both within the UK and globally. And uh, over to you, Jessica. Thanks, Dan. I'm so pleased to be chairing the panel today, which is made up of finalists from the crowdsourcing open call, along with other stakeholders from within Africa. And I'm really looking forward to today's discussion, which will look at many of the barriers that any just raised. So I will introduce each of the panelists uh, alphabetically, um, but just want to flag that throughout our discussion today, please do add any questions or comments into the Q&A as at the end of the panel, we will have time to open this up to a wider discussion uh, and answer any questions that come in. Uh, and I would also uh, ask the panelists just to put on their cameras. Uh, so our first panelist today is Dr. Clement. He is a, the Deputy Director in the Nigerian Federal Ministry of Health and is a public health specialist with over 15 years experience. Dr. Manal El Sayed is Professor of Pediatrics at Ain Shams University in Cairo, Egypt. She is the Clinical Director of the National HC Pediatric Treatment Program and Director of the Clinical Research Unit and Co-Supervisor of the Viral Hepatitis Treatment Center at Ain Shames University. She's also one of the founders and co-chairs of the Calder Conference. Dudone Haki Zimana is a Burundian uh, and one of our crowdsourcing finalists. In 2019, he started a postgraduate training course in nuclear sciences in Algeria. He is a carrier of hepatitis B, which he was tested for in 2000. He's also the president and founder of an association for the fight against viral hepatitis. Dr. Benoit Kuwakanu is a qualified medical doctor currently studying for specialization in hep hepatogastroenterology in Marrakesh. He is also another of one of our finalists um, that's joining us today and is the current president of the NGO, Wassam Benin, which is a founding member of ABOSCHVI, a Beninese Association of Civil Society Organizations working together for the fight against viral hepatitis. And our Honorable Esther Passius is a member of parliament representing Nairobi County, the capital city in Kenya. Uh, in the National Assembly, uh, Esther is an active member of the Committee on Health and the Special Funds Account Committee. She's also a founding member of the Kenya Parliamentary Caucus on the Sustainable Development Goals and Business. Internationally, Esther is the Chapter Chair, Eastern and Southern Africa at UNITE, a global association of parliamentarians working to end infectious diseases. And we are also joined today by Ben Lees, but I think possibly uh, she may have dropped off the line. Um, so, Ben Lee, are you there? No. Um, but we saw Ben Lee's incredibly powerful submission uh, to the competition uh, earlier. And, you know, I think what struck us all with that was just how powerful it was to see uh, a child speak out a uh, around viral hepatitis, you know, viral hepatitis does disproportionately affect children with mother to child transmission of hepatitis B continuing to be a major cause um, of transmission. And I think hepatitis in children uh, and the impact hepatitis has on children is not often spoken about. So, you know, we were incredibly pleased to, to have one of our finalists be a, a child. Um, but Manal, you are such a strong advocate for hepatitis uh, and young people. And so I'll put this to you. What needs to be done to improve the lives of young people living with viral hepatitis? 
thank you very much, uh, Jessica. First of all, I'm, I'm very happy to be part of this because I've been advocating for um, viral hepatitis in children for more than 30 years, ever since I started to work on viral hepatitis in children. And I've seen a lot, and I'm very happy that we have one of the finalists who's a child, and could she speak out uh, uh, for herself and for her colleagues? Um, children often have big problems apart from stigma. They do have uh, educational problems. Then you have uh, neurocognitive problems. Um, uh, they can't do any activities. They're usually very uh, weak all the time, fatigued all the time, tired. So we have all the reasons to look after children and very, very early in life to be able to give them the, the, the proper growth and development that they really need. And I believe this should be multi-pronged, and I'm happy that we're starting all to work together. It needs a multi-stakeholders engagement. Um, and we should start, as she mentioned, with awareness. We need different packages of awareness, and I think the World Hepatitis Alliance can uh, help develop different packages, one for the public and one for the healthcare providers. You'll be surprised to know that pediatricians and obstetricians are not aware of hepatitis in children. And some of them really need a lot of education. And I think an important package would be addressed to the healthcare providers and the general practitioners as well. And we also need a package for the HCV infected adults because we need to start testing their families. I think one approach that would make things much easier is to start family testing. Those people are already linked to care, whether for hep B or hep C, and they have families, they have spouses, they have children, and they have even cousins. And we can start and uh, do some a package, a special package for the families for awareness. And uh, I believe that we should leverage also on the COVID-19. There's a lot of awareness about prevention for COVID-19. And it would be very useful to integrate a, a package of prevention with the COVID-19 for viral hepatitis uh, in education, in schools, in the curriculum, integrate in curricula of university students, of the young people in colleges. Uh, we had a lot of university campaigns uh, in the young uh, people, 18 and above, and even younger. Some of them go to university a little bit younger. And it worked like wonders. We had after this campaign, 6,000 volunteers. It was a nationwide campaign. And they started spreading the messages to their families and to their peers and to everybody. And that in itself helps to remove stigma. The awareness in itself is important to remove the stigma. And uh, I think there is, there is also another approach to reach the, the government or to reach the ministries. Uh, we need to have advocacy groups, uh, whether from the um, NGOs or the civil society and the communities. And we need to have voices also from physicians. And I'm happy that we have also uh, somebody, a parliamentarian on board, because this is really important. The voice of the parliamentarians is really important to reach governments and to start to look at things, whether we're going to approach uh, this in children and young people in a micro or macro elimination uh, uh, approach. You know, you can just target the high risk groups, uh, the, 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 the young child, the, the beautiful child mentioned transfusion. I'm seeing still post transfusion hepatitis in Egypt, despite the fact that we have the largest global elimination program for hepatitis C. I'm still seeing hepatitis C in high-risk population groups. We're still seeing children getting infected from their mothers. So I think we should uh, encourage people and their families to start to be the voice for this, to protect their children, to prevent uh, transmission of virus, viral hepatitis. And advocacy with the media would be a key, and they would, pay, they would play a pivotal role. The media for the campaigns in Egypt played a pivotal role in awareness activities. And we can develop even some animated uh, movies, short movies to be spread over social media and uh, on TV and have some interviews uh, live uh, in the media and in the global media, international media. Uh, I think this would be a very important uh, part before we start integrating the testing and treatment within guidelines and policies. You need the awareness first. Thank you, Vinal. I could not agree more. And I think, you know, you have a really good point around really needing to activate people and, and what you've done with the university students in, in getting them to, to raise awareness. And 
I, I think that's really important. Um, I've seen that Fran Lise has joined us again. So I just want to see, uh, Fran Lise, are you able to hear us? It, it looks like maybe there, there are a few audio problems. So we might move on uh, and then Brandlis, when you are able to connect, we'll come back to you. Um, but Manal, you touched quite a bit on stigma, which I, is really important. And Judene, your submission to the Global Hepatitis Contest highlighted the stigma and discrimination you have faced as someone living with viral hepatitis and how this inspired you to set up your NGO, the Association for the Fight Against Viral Hepatitis. And so, Dune, what challenges have you faced in trying to address stigma and discrimination in Burundi? Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. I was tested positive in uh, the fall 2020, 20, uh, 2000, sorry. I started medical treatment. The sound is really bad, so it's very difficult to hear him. The interpreter is really doing her best. So this is... Uh, this is when my students discovered that I had hepatitis. We lost the sound, so the interpreter cannot hear Jidon anymore. I'm sorry. The interpreter cannot hear Jidon. Judene, uh, I hear we have lost your sound. Uh, are you? Have we lost you completely? Uh, it looks like it. Um, so sorry, everyone. Unfortunately, we are dealing with internet uh, issues, and that is just the fact of this uh, COVID, post-COVID, current COVID world, isn't it? Um, but while we're talking about stigma and discrimination, maybe to the the panelists that is still on the line. What can we do to better combat stigma and discrimination? Uh, and maybe I'll, I'll open this up both to the panelists and to Dan Juma, uh, who was, uh, gave the opening remarks today, but is such a strong advocate for, for hepatitis in Nigeria. So Dan Juma, please feel free to also uh, contribute to the conversation. Um, Okay. Is it open for us to make contributions? Yeah, yes, please. Thank you so much, Jessica. Um, for me as a person, I think one of the icebreakers for me was to, to the disclosure of my status. I openly disclosed my status and I've shared this on social media. I have, I shared it to my partner first and then I didn't feel the shame of saying it to the media. I didn't feel the shame. Initially, yes, I had the fear of being... Um, rejected as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a medical uh, person working in the hospital. So I had the fear of what, when I first overcame that, share with my partner, and then I disclosed my status openly. I think that really helped me, first of all, as an individual to have the confidence to speak more about hepatitis. So first of all, partner disclosure and open disclosure of status probably is one way to break this cycle of stigma and then this conspiracy of silence and awareness about hepatitis. Because up to now, Many people still think hepatitis is contagious and could be transmitted through um, I mean, through airborne, airborne stuff. So that's why people discriminate against people living with hepatitis. So awareness will go a long way to really, really break this stigma and to reduce discrimination against people living with hepatitis. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Dan Juma. And I think you're so right. People have, being empowered to speak out and share their stories is, is so powerful. Uh, Esther? Thank you. Um, first of all, I, um, yeah, I'm a member of parliament in Kenya and a disclosure. I was a member of the health committee, but I'm no longer a member of the health committee. I, I, I change the public investments, but of course, matters health uh, as a legislator, um, we're all concerned. I, I, I feel we need, uh, first of all, for awareness, 
um, uh, Danjuma is uh, came out and said he has it. And I think if we had more and more videos out in the in the social media, I mean, I look at Kenya for instance, the entire population we we are, they're all on the internet, they're all um, on social media. So we should have many many videos out that speak to this issue and talk to the talk to uh, the leaders because the, the, there's a there's a fight for resources right now and if we want resources to be dedicated to a certain area we've got to get the the the, the people living with hepatitis the people who had uh, trauma because of it the people who uh, mistreatment or mother to child transmission if we had these stories coming out then you bring it closer to the reality and I also feel data, data, data. I think even Kenya is lacking in some of this data. And if we are able to work with the civil society that's concerned, but we need to have partners that actually drive this agenda. I mean, like right now, talking nutrition, it's a big issue. You have actually NGOs with various partners from the UN who drive the initiative. I mean, parliament can legislate, parliament can allocate budgets, parliament, parliament can help introduce policy but unless parliament is made aware daily right and then i also agree with dr manal that you know uh the way covid came up with the protocols we should also come up with protocols for hepatitis so that at least people can become aware that you can do this we did it for typhoid it went off at, at one point and i think covid has shown us that if we communicate to the citizens properly the citizens you know, we learn something and be able to yeah. Great. Thank you so much, Esther. And I completely agree. I, you know, all of those points are going to be so important. Uh, Dr. Clement? Okay, thank you, Jessica. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, can you hear you. me. Okay, okay. So I, I totally agree with all the submissions, but I know uh, we, we are dealing with behavioral change, and that will not happen uh, in a day or uh, quick like that. There is no quick fix for that. So what I want to say in essence is that we must be persistent and we must not get tired of giving the right information and uh, using the right uh, medium to pass across our message. Uh, everything will not be on social media because we still have our people in the grassroots. That's why you need to involve um, society organizations to get into the interiors, um, the art to reach, who do not have uh, access to all this social media and the rest. But, but, but my message is that we shouldn't get tired of uh, putting the information there. Look at HIV, uh, for example. Uh, HIV response has been there for over 20 years. Viral hepatitis is less than 10 years. So uh, we can have uh, similar uh, achievement in terms of um, getting awareness. I, I mean, I mean, uh, overcoming stigma and all, all of that uh, within those few years that uh, we've we've had uh, a, a global response to a viral hepatitis. Thank you. Thank you, and I think that's a, a really good point. You know, we've achieved a lot in a short amount of time, but you know, it it, it has been a short amount of time, and we. We need to stay motivated um, and keep working together. Uh, Benoit? Je vous remercie, Madame Jessica. Uh, Thank you, uh, Jessica. Concerning the experience in my country in Bina regarding discrimination and care, a bill has been introduced the interpreter cannot hear dr benoit properly sorry uh, benoit um désolé could you try uh speaking into the microphone uh or sort of pulling the microphone more to your mouth, the interpreters are, are having trouble. The sound is not really better. I'm doing my best. So we've launched uh, advocacy. And so a bill was introduced 
to fight against discrimination in, in my country, in Benin. So there are solutions that have been brought against, brought against um, perpetrators of discrimination. But unfortunately, what we see is that despite law being the law being implemented, um, the situation situation has not changed. It's very difficult for um, hepatitis carriers to talk about it with their employers or with their friends and families sometimes because they fear and discrimination. So we are here to share their stories, but they still find difficult to talk about it. So policymakers need to find a solution to really implement these anti-discrimination rules. So we need to raise awareness. I'm sorry, it's very difficult to hear. Merci, uh, thank you. And I think that it's a really important point around the fact that just because there is a discrimination law in place, which is a really important part of the puzzle, it doesn't necessarily mean uh, that things have changed on the ground for the people living with viral hepatitis. And so there is really um, importance around awareness raising and making sure that those anti-discrimination laws are applied in practice. Uh, so I can see that Drew uh, Dune has joined us again. Uh, so if you can hear us, do you want to put your audio on? We've just been uh, having a discussion around stigma and discrimination. And so it would be great to, to get your experiences of that in Burundi. Thank you very much. As I said already, I've been through very difficult times. I was tested positive in 2002, um, so I have hepatitis B, and I've experienced very hard, um, a very hard um, period of time during secondary school, specifically. And all these problems led me. Um, to, well, in my family, there were other hepatitis uh, cases. My father died from hepatitis and, and other people as well, my brother, and there were all other carriers in my family. So I've been victim of stigmatization. I've been um, nicknamed. So I'm trying to meet with people um, that were also victims of hepatitis and they shared with me their stories. They were heartbreaking. And this is when I decided to found with those people, an organization to fight against um, this discrimination, because if you carry hepatitis, um, you are frowned upon in my community. Um, many people 
are not treated, are not cured. And if you have that disease, you're considered dead. It's as simple as that. The difficulty was also to find partners. We created that organization to fight against discrimination. Um, when I when I talked about partnerships, I, I meant partners, so it's difficult to find a partner. It's still taboo because, as I said, we're considered dead already. So if you're tested positive, um, doctors tell you, okay, go back home and um, you just have to wait until it's, until it's over. But then through this organization that we created, Um, in, in 2015, uh, we've tried to reach out to ministries, to the health minister, to ask him if there were data about hepatitis. And he replied that there's no data, nothing about hepatitis. As far as treatment is concerned, there's no, what he told us is that there was no treatment whatsoever. And regarding youth, I was confronted to that problem while I was at, at school. I told the truth and then I was... Um, <laughs> Four girls broke out with me, broke up with me because I was a carrier. And, and um, the reason why I told them it was simply not to transmit the disease to them. But they rejected me. But there are some people who decide to simply hide their disease. And which is one of the reasons why we decided to create that organization. Now, boys who carry hepatitis B can marry to um, girls who don't have the disease. For people who want to get married, um, well, they have to take a test to make sure that they are not carriers. So the girl, if, if the boy is a hepatitis B carrier, the girl needs to be vaccinated. That's the rule. Well, at least... For, for the moment. So it's a, some sort of achievement, but um, we need to continue uh, raising awareness. We need to um, make sure the media get involved to, to raise awareness a bit further. There's a lack of training. Uh, there are uh, awareness raising campaigns. We've managed to gather the uh, testimonies of some victims uh, through the radio. So we've managed to start changing perceptions on that disease and on, on carriers. Our goal is to have people realize that we have the same rights as other people. So we are 
training doctors so that they know how they will treat uh, these people with hepatitis. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and thank you so much for, for sharing your story with us. I am sorry that you had such a, a difficult time, but, you know, by speaking out and, and sharing your story and, and set it and using that uh, to really drive you to set up your NGO, um, I think it, it's incredible sort of the impact you will have on the, the lives of others. Now, one of the uh, things that you mentioned was the, the work you've done uh, in reaching out to the Ministry of Health. And Dr. Clement, one of the, the items you uh, mentioned was how important it was to involve civil society. And I think it would be great uh, to get your perspective as someone working in the Nigerian Federal Ministry of Health why it is so important to engage civil society and, and the impact that that has had on the response in Nigeria. Thank you, Jessica. I hope you can hear me. We can, yes. Okay. Um, I think it's um, very important to involve um, civil society organizations. Uh, no doubt about that. Some of the slides that um, were presented, we could see lots of challenges that are still the devil variabilities response uh, across the globe and the, the 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 story is not different in nigeria we still have lots of challenges be it in terms of um stigma discrimination case finding challenges funding and the rest of them loads of challenges uh, for, for me for me uh we are not um we are not in any way uh demotivated because of all these challenges just like I said, uh, HIV AIDS response, it's um, uh, over 40 years. Uh, it's kudos to what Hepatitis Alliance, uh, the effort that um, you guys have uh, uh, put up uh, in terms of uh, making sure viral hepatitis response at the global level uh, is there. We, we, are, we have been able to put some viral hepatitis uh, on the agenda globally. So uh, we, we could see what you are doing and the World Hepatitis Alliance is actually made up of um, civil society organizations across uh, in countries of the world, uh, including Nigeria. So if we could learn from what you are doing at global level, why it will be, uh, it, it's just uh, will be full added for us not to involve uh, civil society organizations. So uh, for us, involvement of civil society organizations means engaging them in planning, implementation and advocacy. That is what's uh, an evaluation as well. I, I mean, in planning, implementation and evaluation, that is what it means to us. And um, as I tell you, um, the IS advisory body for variabilities response in Nigeria, uh, what we call technical working group at the national level, uh, society organizations are fully part of that body. And that's the highest body that we have in Nigeria. So they, they advise the federal ministry of it on what do we do? What are those challenges? Where are the gaps? And what do we what do we need to do? So they have they have a voice to to guide the direction of the response at the national level. And we encourage all subnational level, whenever they are setting up such committee or such body, they must involve suicide organizations. And, I, and I've seen experiences at the subnational level. So I, I think that's the starting point for us. Uh, where they have a voice to say, no, this cannot happen. Yes, this is this is good. And um, uh, that has uh, really turned to, uh, that has, we've had lots of um, uh, gains from that. There have been a lot of gains. Uh, whatever we have achieved today, it is, uh, society organizations have contributed immensely to it. Uh, I remember in 2018, civil society organizations actually led the first summit in Nigeria, hepatitis summit. And, um, uh, and that's led to so many other, uh, many other effects. We had a lot of, uh, what do you call it? A lot of um, uh, achievement following that. Uh, so, and, and when you look at policy phase of this response, uh, Nigeria has done so well in terms of policy phase. In fact, uh, we remember that um, 
in terms of putting down all those policy guidance, I mean, policy documents, weather plan, weather guidelines, and so on and so forth, Nigeria used to lead the rest of Africa. And it is kudos to suicide organizations who actually helped us to make sure uh, this uh, become very important. I mean, this, uh, uh, this that we achieve this. And then outside that, uh, I've, I've also seen that um, in terms of implementation, where we still have challenges. Uh, and that's, as we all know, that um, viral hepatitis uh, across, the, across the country of Africa, even globally now, uh, you do not have um, uh, external funding like you have for HIV and the rest of them. You don't have global fund as much. You don't have PEFA fund. And that's a good way to start because we have to talk about sustainability. We must look inward, domestic funding. And that's also, we are seeing a lot of efforts of um, civil society organizations. It is not working well. It, we are not there yet. There are still a lot of challenges, but we are moving. It may, it may not be as much as we are, we, we, we hope to get quickly, but we are seeing some of, of some of these efforts of civil society organizations in Nigeria putting pressures on um, governments, on individuals, private bodies to, to, to put fund and make sure that uh, we can respond to hepatitis challenge. And as I tell you, we, we do have a subcommittee at the national, national level that is looking at advocacy and resource mobilization. And the, 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 the head or, or the chair for that subcommittee is a civil society organization or member. So, so you can see how important uh, we, we really uh, want to work with social organizations. And, and, and it's also very crucial that if you must control hepatitis in Africa, in this region, Ni Nigeria becomes very, very important. If you are able to achieve hepatitis control in Nigeria, then um, I, 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 I could almost say the rest of Africa should go to sleep. Because when you talk about contribution of uh, Nigeria to hepatitis in, in the region, it's actually high. Nigeria is a large country of over 200 million. And where you are saying that um, the prevalence of hepatitis B is, um, is 8.1%. 8 and for HCV is 1.1%. So we are looking at, uh, we, are, we are talking about um, um, body of over 20 million people. So um, we, we, we've we had a lot of impacts from civil society organizations. And we, we just discussed uh, issues around stigma and discrimination. And if you must achieve that, the civil society organizations are actually uh, part of the community who can help us reach where many of us can never reach. They are part of the community. People, are, some of them are leaders in the community. People recognize them. People recognize their voices. So if you want to pass the message across, then it becomes important that um, you use uh, this very important uh, stakeholder. So um, I, I think I will leave it there uh, so that I don't take much of the time. Thank you. Anova. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think it's, you know, it's absolutely great to hear how uh, within Nigeria, uh, the, the federal ministry and state ministries really are seeing civil society as partners who are involved in every stage of the response. And I really hope that other countries uh, follow that example. Uh, I know we're getting um, running a little bit close to the end of the, the time we had allocated for the panel. But we do have uh, two more questions. Um, so firstly to uh, Benoit, your submission to the Global Hepatitis Contest was a scripted scenario, which was designed to sensitize policymakers on viral hepatitis. Now, why did you decide to target uh, policymakers and what message would you like them uh, to take away from your submission? And if I can ask you to keep your answer uh, fairly brief, that would be much appreciated. Pour euh, ce scénario que nous avons étudié, cela nous a été, nous sommes inspirés par des faits vécus dans la société. Et l'idée nous est venue pour lutter efficacement contre hépatite, les hépatites virales. Il faut avoir un projet d'avoir des villes sans hépatites. 
si on a une ville par hépatite et que sans hépatite, pardon, et que dans chaque pays, dans, dans tous les pays, toutes les villes sont sans hépatite en observant les dispositions que nous avons prises, cela pourrait nous conduire d'ici 2030 à, avoir, à, à éradiquer complètement euh, l'hépatite de notre pays. Je donne un exemple. Nous prenons par exemple un village ici. Nous avons essayé de contacter l'élu local. Qui est le we, we have tried to contact our local uh, elected persons uh, who represented our project. And we worked on the consequences of hepatitis on human health and the possible complications. This uh, person asked us how to work with the civil society and how we could take the right measures in terms of prevention. The, the, the sound is really bad and the interpreter is really doing her best, but it's, it's difficult to hear him. So we have to take cost of treatment into consideration because the cost is very high and uh, the population cannot face this kind of cost. This is why we thought it was important to carry out advocacy towards decision makers. We also worked with people in power because they had the capacity to help the population to take this cost to to, to in, into consideration. In some cases, children can't be screened uh, because of the cost of screening, the cost of treatment. In this concrete example, one child died and the elected person realized that by not helping, by not using his or her position, he was responsible of uh, uh, the children, this child's death. So it's not only civil society that has to fight uh, against hepatitis, it has to be a political decision, it has to come from political will. In the case of uh, polio, uh, the different countries of the region decided to, erad to eradicate the disease and we managed it. Uh, we should do the same with, with hepatitis. So we have to start with screening the uh, positive cases and then work with DPs so that uh, cost of treatment can, can be uh, uh, seen by the state. And then the state needs to provide subsidies, as it was the case with other uh, uh, diseases. If we manage this, we'll be able to reduce the uh, contamination rates. And another thing is prevention that is crucial. We realized that many children uh, are infected when very young and they uh, become chronic uh, uh, patients. Uh, so by reducing uh, mother to child transmission, we can also reduce the number of uh, chronic patients. Also, 
screening of hepatitis has to be free and all women must uh, be able to carry out a screening before they give birth so that we can uh, prevent mother to child uh, transmission. So for these children, we suggested uh, automatic vaccination at birth and we started this measure last year uh, and we started delivering vaccines to hospitals so that children could be vaccinated at birth and we continue our advocacy work so that all hospitals, public and private, can have this vaccine. So this is uh, the situation in our country. Uh, and we would definitely like to eradicate hepatitis in our country. And we, we would need uh, extra support to uh, fully eradicate uh, hepatitis in our country. Thank you. And, I, you know, I, there were very uh, many important points there, but one that struck me was really the need for political will. And so, Esther, in your opinion, how can these submissions and, and stories like these um, that were sent in for the Global Hepatitis Contest be leveraged to accelerate action by policymakers? I think we need to put them out. Uh, first of all, I mean, you know, right now with COVID and trying to get uh, with all the restrictions and the Ministry of Health being so overwhelmed with trying to vaccinate as many people as possible. And the focus is on uh, COVID responses. And I think the most important thing is to capture their eye with tagging, tagging the various uh, ministries uh, and county governments with messages that are emotive. You know, hey, we're here, don't forget, you know. I, I think, um, as I said, there'll be a scramble for resources. There's, there's limited resources. But if we do a structured campaign that also gets other people talking, like, are you suffering or do you, do you know that this could be happening to you, you know, because you're, you, you're a carrier or remove the stigma? I feel that social media has been a key instrument to drive governments to move. And especially now that Kenya is heading to an election year, I think it's important that if we can identify uh, through the hospitals, through the medics, through the NGOs, the people that actually are suffering and get them to tell their stories, and then also getting them to tell their stories, they need to see that other people have, have, have also spoken about their experiences. And I feel then you, you, you come out, the stigma ends because somebody comes out and says, hey, I, I too am hepatitis positive. And this is what I this is what uh, I need. This is what I want my government to do for me. This is what I want my leader to do for me. I remember when we every time we come to an election, you have to sign and say I commit to this. I think we should do a drive, but then we need the data because sometimes when you talk without the data, and the other way to drive the data is to do uh, on Twitter. You can do a poll or and just get people to say, hey, are you? And then we see the numbers, uh, you know, out of maybe a thousand, how many people c come up and say, you know, they know someone or, you know, um, they, they themselves suffer from hepatitis and what's the stigma, what's the experience, what's the experience in the hospital, uh, what's the experience in terms of uh, information, mental health, uh, emotions, because, you know, I mean, Dr. Manal said that there was, there was also some, some things that, you know, your performance in school, your tiredness, you know, a teacher might be thinking you're lazy, and yet you uh, you you suffer from the virus, and you you don't have the energy. So, I think information is power, and uh, putting it out in public domain will make people become aware. I'm willing, if you know any of the NGOs and civil society that are in Kenya, I'm willing to actually organize for them to actually go and give uh, and get an engagement with the health committee, because when it comes to budget. Only the people who come to us for budgets will get it. So, you know, you ask for budgets to be put for this, uh, you know, for the uh, for the mother to child, for the awareness, for 
uh, the uh, the social support. So I feel um, there's a lot of work to be done, and that's that's across the board in almost everything from cancers to ophthalmology to you know uh, to diabetes. There is a, a scramble for resources, and because we know that there's limited resources, only numbers will be able to dictate how much uh, will be done towards this particular sector. And I feel that no one should be left behind. So every voice should be heard and every uh, person who is affected and impacted by the virus should be able to get the support that they need. I mean, after all, it's, yeah, it's leave no one behind. And you, you have to realize that COVID has taken us way back. So whatever gains we've had are probably eroded. So it's like starting from zero again. Absolutely. And I think that message around the head and the heart, you know, how do we bring the emotive messaging with the data is so important. Uh, and that's really how we will start to, to move the needle. Manali, see you've got your hand up. Yeah, it's, it's just uh, I, I would like to uh, um, confirm what's been said, but because in Egypt, in fact, the 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 advocacy that came from the public and the demand and the empowerment of the public is what made the government respond. And in fact, we use the exact mechanism of people running into elections and selecting the right people in the parliament, because at that time also everybody, even those parliamentarians, knew somebody from their family who was infected with hepatitis. So, so they were also touched by the problem. And I think for children, uh, the situation was different. We've been advocating for years, but despite the fact that we had a program, a big program for the adults since 2006 and the largest in the world, we started treating children through an NGO program. It's an NGO. I'm the secretary general of this NGO. And I spoke to the board and I said, we need to get children tested and treated. And they immediately approved. And I had a very nice program. Uh, we actually furnished specialized centers for those children in university hospitals. And we used those same centers when the DAAs were available to start a program with DAAs. And the government realized that actually when we spoke to the president, and we had a meeting with the president before the national screening, and I told him about the program, this model of care that we had with the NGO and I told him, Your Excellency, we have children who are infected, and most of them, they get the infection either through uh, blood transfusions or through hospitals, and some of them get them from their mothers. And he immediately approved the school screening program. So I think there, there's a lot to do for children, and we need people to speak out, uh, not only the children, their parents, their families, and how much they're suffering with the children. Uh, I have children, even though they clear the virus uh, automatically, they were stigmatized. I have young adolescents who have been kicked out from, uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, the Naval Academy. Somebody was kicked out before his final year because he was antibody positive for HCV, but he's PCR negative because he cleared the virus when he was very young and he never received treatment. He's continuously PCR negative. Things happening for him, he's being stigmatized and, and, and he cannot work anywhere. And despite the fact that we had this largest program screened and tested 60 million people, we've done all this, but still the mindset of some people is that we cannot employ this person, even though he has this certificate that's stamped from the government to say that he cannot transmit infection, he's cleared the infection. Uh, so I think there's a lot uh, to do. And uh, I think there's a lot to do also for Africa, for example, with the African Union, with the African Development Bank, we can get volume purchases for vaccines, for tests, for treatment, and we uh, can get their endorsement uh, with the governments to talk to the governments as well. So these are just some suggestions, and, and I'm happy to assist in wherever, whatever, uh, particularly for children. Thank you, Manal. You are such a strong advocate for children, and I'm glad you brought the conversation back to there, because before I hand off to Dan, I am just going to see if Brandlis is able to join us uh, She's reconnected. So, Brenlis, can you hear us? Possibly not. There might be some issues with audio, but Brenlis, um, do feel free to join in on the chat if you uh, can join us there. Oh. Bonjour, Brenlis. 
Yes, I can hear you. Oh, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, so I will give the, the final remarks of this panel uh, to you, Branley. Uh, so my final question to you is, you know, your submission was so powerful and, and we've got different stakeholders uh, from medical professionals to policymakers, uh, representatives of ministries of health. What message would you like to, to give to them? Can you hear us? Why did you do? I would like to ask the heads of state and ask you money to raise awareness about the situation of children. We also need screening, screening uh, uh, activities and programs. We need screening and treatments. Can you hear me? We can, yes. Thank you. Oui. Je comprends. Nous avons aussi besoin de l'appui pour les traitements. We also need support for our treatments. Merci. Est-ce que vous m'attendez? Uh, can you hear me? Oui. Nous avons besoin de la sensibilisation et de l'appui pour les traitements. So we need a rainous raising and we need support for our treatments. Merci. Thank you, Bronnie. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Uh, Manal, did you have one final thing to say before I hand over to Dan? No, I'm very, I'm very, really, I'm very happy to see her um, talking and speaking on behalf of children. And I think we need many, many more. And that's going to touch a lot of hearts. And uh, I believe that might be the way uh, forward. Absolutely. Uh, so thank you to everyone. Um, please stay on because we'll have questions now. Um, but I'll hand over to Dan to manage those. Thanks, Jessica. This is a really, really rich discussion, and I see a lot of engagement from the audience uh, uh, as well as from the panelists. And I think, um, unfortunately, we're going over a little bit uh, beyond the time, uh, but we still have, uh, I think we have four or five minutes for taking one question, and I see that uh, William Rimac has a uh, hand up, so if you would like to uh, um, open your audio and you can uh, speak to the panel um, directly. Hi, uh, this is Bill Remack, and I'd just like to say that there's been a number of programs done uh, also throughout history in the last hundred years where uh, because of environmental issues and economic issues, literacy issues, health issues, um, children and, and young adults have been educated in the issues of concern and have then uh, acted as um, 
uh, as then teachers or trainers to uh, let the next generations, the older adults, know about issues that they would not otherwise then have access to the kind of awareness or technology that is out there and available to the youth today. And having those kinds of programs uh, is a way to uh, reach those harder to reach populations. And I was wondering if there are programs like that in Africa being done right now uh, that have proved some effectiveness. Thanks, William, for the question. Would um, some of the panelists take the question? And please do keep the answers brief because uh, um, we're running out of time here. Thank you. I, I, I can say just we have uh, uh, an experience with the university program, uh, the young students who were advocates and they went out to spread the awareness material. And then one other thing that we had a drawing contest for the younger children and they expressed themselves and we, uh, uh, this contest actually all those drawings, they went out and people started to see them and how they feel about having hepatitis. So these are our two experiences. Uh, maybe the, the university campaign uh, uh, also was repeated in some of the high schools. And, and really this is really important that to leverage on the young people's energy and adolescence, and we can and spread out the information and awareness and uh, be the advocates for themselves. That's excellent. Thank you. Thanks, Manal, for the response. And I saw that Esperance, who is one of the finalists um, for, for our uh, open call. So if we could take that one question from Esperance, please. Prince, can you, um, are you able to? We, we can't really hear. Oh, uh, we can hear you now. Please. Let's go ahead. Let's go ahead, please. Oui, euh, je disais, c'est par rapport à l'intervention de Bralis, et c'est juste pour, pour appuyer encore son intervention. Il est vrai, vraiment, euh, dans notre pays, la RDC, euh, nous retrouvons Le programme qui s'occupe du VIH. So regarding Brandy's intervention, we fully agree with her. Mais en ce qui concerne les hépatites, jusque là, ça pose encore problème. Euh, je crois que ça demande vaut la peine. Il est vraiment plus qu'urgent. So we need some screening. This is urgent. Ça se partage facilement même dans nos familles. Même les parents. Because hepatitis is spreading within families. So if children have information, reliable information about the disease, about the viruses, they know about transmission, J'ajoute encore pour demander à tout le monde, même nos autorités, de soutenir ces clubs de enfants. So I, I fully support these youth clubs, these youth associations, and uh, I um, urge governments to support these clubs so that they can share information. Thank you. 
Okay, thanks for um, for the comments. Um, any any responses from the panel? I think we're um, we're getting close to the end of the uh, discussion. Um, they, um, I think it might be better to pass the floor to uh, Denjuma to conclude for the webinar. Over to you, Denjuma. Thank you, Dan, and thank you so much to all the wonderful panel members. And thank you to all the audience, the participants for joining this call. I think uh, among so many other things, one key lesson I've learned from this meeting is amplifying the voice of children and young adults to speak and advocate, especially on matters concerning viral hepatitis. I think this is one um, major lesson I'm looking at and how do we replicate that? So beyond the discussions, beyond the engagement, what can we do? I think very four very, very important things have come up from this one, issues around data. Honorable Esther Pasaris has mentioned that, reiterated that, the essence of data. We need evidence, we need data to convince policy, to drive advocacy, and even to get funding. And of course, awareness creation. I remember Dr. Clement mentioning, we need to go beyond top webinars. We need to go to communities. We need to go to hard on rich populations to drive awareness, to raise the bar, about hepatitis, to break the, that conspiracy of silence about hepatitis. And we need collaboration. Professor Manal has mentioned beautifully the, Egypt, the Egyptian example. It took the collaboration between physicians, advocates, media, to raise the need for hepatitis. And that is one of the success stories about Egypt. So that is also possibly what we need to do in Africa. And I'm glad to say that probably with the collaboration around this room, we need to have a united voice to move this needle about awareness, data, and even funding for civil society, as mentioned by one of the one of the participants in this meeting. So, on behalf of the World Hepatitis Alliance and all the organizers of this meeting, I want to say thank you to all the panel members. Thank you, everybody. And the message is that let's go back and drive awareness. Let's go back and speak about hepatitis to ensure that we all contribute to those viral hepatitis elimination. Thank you so much. I will look forward to more engagement. The remaining part of the call that meeting. Thank you. Bye for now from me. Thank you, Danjuma. Thank you everyone for joining the webinar.